you are welcome to this sixth section on Security Revolution Conference 2023. The topic Cybercrime in Nigeria the tools for investigation, prevention, and prosecution. We are presenting from Nigeria and the United States. My name is Frank Bazwaye. I'm a cybersecurity analyst, a digital forensic investigator, and founder LiveGig Limited. Presenting from Nigeria, we have Barista Victor, who is not here. He will join us later. He's a legal practitioner and managing counsel Act Law Practice Lagos, Nigeria. Also presented from Nigeria, we have Inusa Suleiman. He's an investigative journalist. He's the CEO of Slide B Media Innovation. He shall be presented on the tools for asset security, a specific focus on cyber security. Also presented from the United States, we have Sheila Oduru. She is the regional cybersecurity analyst for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in the United States. She will present him on the tools for cybersecurity investigation and prevention. Also, Shela, Shela Oduru, she was my team lead during my cybersecurity training at Eretmis Academy in New York. Within the next few hours, we hope to engage in a fluid conversation on cybersecurity. Without further ado, I would like to hand over the mic to Sheila Oduru. Please, the mic is yours. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us. And good morning, uh, good afternoon, and evening, wherever you might be. Um, so, as um, Frank introduced me. I am the regional analyst for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and I will be presenting um, on the topic cybersecurity crime um, tools for prevention and um, investigation. I will share my screen in a moment and then get started. I'll just present on it real quick. All right. So, um, like I said, uh, the topic is cyber uh, crime tools for prevention and investigation. Uh, case study is um, Africa. Uh, of course, we'll be talking about it. Um, and then uh, a focus on uh, Nigeria, but Africa as a whole. Um, okay. All right. So the nature of um, cyber crime. A uh, cyber crime is basically any crime, um, not in a traditional way. The traditional crime, as we know, is somebody actually committing the crime in person. Uh, we know the location they are committing the crime. But when it comes to cyberspace, a person can be committing the crime from um, a specific places that cannot be identified. And actually, the crime will be occurring digitally or uh, in the cyberspace. Um, and uh, tools or um, the means that a crime is usually committed is through computers, uh, cell phones, uh, the primary network, um, and and, all, and so forth. Um, and then when the crime is being committed, like I said, it's not physical, but it, this crime, just like uh, physical crime being committed um, against individuals, cyber crime is also committed against individuals, um, corporations, businesses, uh, small or medium businesses, government um, entities, it can affect them um, massively. Uh, cyber, cyber crime has no uh, ge geographical limits. It can commit crime from anywhere and attack anybody from wherever. Um, so these are some of the few um, cyber crimes out there. Of course, there's a huge um, number of them. This is just a few of them. Uh, social media uh, fraud. Um, people can impersonate a person. They can use your um, your photo to commit a crime and create um, another um, account and do many things. Uh, phishing will send you um, a fraudulent email, uh, misleading, um, as similar to email scam. 
um, identity theft, um, when somebody's identity information is being taken, like uh, in the state, somebody can take your social security, um, your driver's license, and so forth. In Africa, similar, anything that is identifiable information that you is used to identify you in the country, uh, a person can take that and, and create a lot of problems for you. They can impersonate you in, in many ways. Extortion, we have, of course, finance, um, financial extortion and, and many forth, uh, many, many other forms of extortion. A bank fraud, that is usually what we think when we think about um, cyber crime, we think that it's all about money. It's not usually, I mean, it's not all the time money, but yes, money comes in place. Uh, when a person get in contact with your bank information, your personal information, they can have access to your bank account or wherever you save your money and just take it, take over it. Um, computer viruses and and like I said, there's so many um, other forms. So identity theft is usually um, the invasion online crime that can uh, be a long term damage effect on a person. Not just financial or reputation, it can affect you and more. Um, for example, using somebody's personal information, um, an identity theft can open new uh, credit card, like I said, and, and then utilize it to still steal your money. Um, extortion, uh, one way of cyber crime, extort online through um, a ransomware. And then um, another form of extortion that can be made, um, that actually made a headline is that crypto jacking. Um, if you remember the organization, an individual who fall victim to uh, a successful a uh, crypto jacking attack um, are placed in an unfortunate or unfavorable uh, position. You put your information on the dark web and, and it, it, it's not good. So, um, all right. Um, when we think about the concept of uh, cyber crime prevention, there are so many uh, ways that we can help prevent these crimes from happening. Uh, we, we will think that why don't we just take take away the risk or take away um, what is causing this. But of course, when it comes to cybersecurity, we all know that it's not that it's not that simple. Um, it's always um, understood that we can only mitigate the risk. And so these are some of the ways we can use to mitigate it, uh, bring it to um, an acceptable level that organization or individual or the country can live with. So um, if you do, um, practice um, um, or implement um, proactive uh, measures in place to help mitigate um, that risk or mitigate um, the problem. That is the way that you are using, you're doing to prevent um, the crime. Access control, of course, um, it's one of the means that you can use to um, mitigate it. That's just an example, but there's many more ways uh, that we can use. So, so, uh, so, so the main tools or the main ways that we can use to prevent uh, cyber crime are as follows. And of course, there's many more, but this is some of them. Uh, firewalls is one major way that an organization can use to uh, prevent cyber crime. So the firewall, the way is 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 set up is in is based on its configuration. So when the organization acquires a firewall. There's so many firewalls, of course, um, he, not here to advertise for a specific firewall uh, vendor, but there's so many different firewalls and how an organization can use a firewall is to configure it uh, with specific rules to monitor the traffic. And so when the traffic change or if there's any suspicious um, behavior going on in the traffic, um, it will be um, the firewall would um, alert um, the organization that, okay, this uh, traffic is coming from here and uh, this is not against the rules. So it gives you like real life um, access to what is going on in your network. Antivirus, of course, is um, it monitor the system, but it actually uh, detects and tries to remove um, uh, malicious softwares um, like malware, uh, like um, viruses, where, um, adware, um, worms and stuff like that. And antivirus is used by major organizations and even individuals, especially at home, um, help to detect and also prevent um, an attack, uh, like phishing emails that usually will come in. Intrusion um, detection and prevention 
there are several tools out there. Um, as I mentioned with antivirus and uh, firewall, there's specific um, um, antivirus vendors that an organization or individual can use. The same way with intrusion detection and prevention, there are specific uh, vendors that you can use. And um, the job of that particular, so, um, that particular tool will be to um, make sure that it's actually um, man trying to detect whatever the traffic or whatever um, attack that is trying to come through your network. And also also try to prevent um, an unauthorized asset access onto your network. It, it monitors the activity. So it basically will alert you. Most of these tools will send an alert to the organization. Usually there's a, a specific person like a cybersecurity analyst that is um, assigned to monitor this tool. So it will send you an alert via email and then you can um, go ahead and investigate if this is a false positive, false negative and so forth, or if this is an actual attack that is uh, going on and, and then activate your incident response and so forth. All right, and then um, another one is uh, uh, VPN. So especially when I think VPN became very um, common, it, it has always been there, but it became very not um, common now when uh, COVID hit and um, especially in the state, a lot of um, organizations has to send uh, their workers home and work from home. Um, or not just that, but even you can be working from somewhere, but the main network where the organization is, you're trying to get access to the network. And that is uh, where VPN comes in and it creates like a form of a tunnel, which puts um, uh, encryption and um, like MFA to make sure that there's extra layer of protection that will prevent attackers from intersecting um, the traffic that is coming from you to um, access data from the main network. Um, so that is how VPN helps uh, prevent an attack, um, increase that tunnel. And then uh, forensic tools. So forensic tools is, is basically, um, I, I will talk about it a little more in the investigation um, uh, process or tools, but it's usually used by investigators um, to help analyze um, evidence and, and even present the evidence in court if necessary of, of an attack that has happened. Uh, so I talked about um, 2FA, this MFA also multi-factor uh, authentication that puts extra layer of uh, protection um, on the assets or on the network, and that will also prevent um, um, or uh, mitigate or reduce the risks that will um, can attackers get access and, and create problems. Um, Cybercrime um, um, prevention tools continue. So uh, data loss prevention, um, there's tools, in, there's specific tools that helps an organization do this. So data loss prevention, usually like um, when, the, when it's set up in such a way that it controls um, a data or um, the inbound and outbound of data. So when a person is sending an email from the organization outside and when an, an email is coming in, that helps, these two helps monitor the um, inbound and outbound traffic of data flow so when when this is set up it's set up in such a way that um when somebody is in in the office or in the network and is trying to send what um is against the rule organizations uh, proprietary uh, um, asset outside this um this tool will prevent that from happening and so forth anything trying to come in so if somebody is somewhere and they are sending an email out that, um, especially when it comes to like PII, uh, PHI, um, PCI information, and um, it's the tool is going to be configured configured in such a way that these things, these specific rules will be in place. And so, when somebody is sending an email out, um, it's going to alert um, the person monitoring the tool that okay this particular email contains this specific information and it's not supposed to go out and so forth so it helps prevent that 
in the same way, um, a similar way as the SIM tools, uh, then there's so many SIM tools, Plank and so forth, and all of them will give you real-time um, response or re real-time alert. Um, and it picks up from um, firewalls, antiviruses, and, and also uh, um, um, IDS and IPS. So um, it sends you real-time alert of what is actually going on on your network. That way you can respond to it as soon as possible. So you can see it actually happening. And if there's a way to stop it, you will be able to see it and uh, be able to uh, take control of it right away. Um, uh, security awareness training is, um, we always say that when it comes to cybersecurity, uh, there's major problems that we have. But when it comes to one of the major problems is people. People are the most risk. Uh, we can configure the network, we can configure softwares, we, uh, I mean, um, 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 computers and all those um, things that needs to be used in the office when it comes to technology. But when it comes to people, you cannot configure people. Um, uh, human behavior and um, can also, and human error. A lot of the um, problems that occurs when it comes to human um, committing these attacks or um, making an error it's, it's mainly um error that was not they didn't really plan to like inside the organization but awareness training is one major thing that um, can help prevent human error can help prevent uh, certain mistakes that uh, can uh, cause a huge problem for the organization when it comes to uh, cyber crime um, so when we talk when we talk about um, cyber crime investigation, um, it's usually the process when a crime has been committed. Um, professionals will come in and try to analyze the situation. Um, sometimes they will use uh, forensic tools um, to assess the network, assess the software, and um, everything that is involved in the process. And that is how they will uh, try to figure out what caused this, who caused that, and so forth. The investigation process could be um, internal um, on the local network, um, or it can be external in, in order to identify the actor of the digital crime and their true intention. So traditional law enforcement here in the United States, traditional law enforcement are taxed to also investigate um, cyber crime. So there's so many um, law enforcement when it comes to cyber crime that um, investigate this. So FBI here in the United States, FBI, excuse me, FBI is in charge of it, um, the local police, and so there's so many of them. The cyber crime investigation uh, um, is usually done by the FBI, the US uh, secret, uh, secret Service, the Internet Crime uh, Compliance Center, the U.S. Uh, Postal um, Inspection Services, um, or the Federal uh, Trade Commission. In Africa, um, with with my research, I see that a lot of a lot of them, Interpol, it's it's coming in to also help when it comes to investigating um, crimes in Africa, cyber crimes in Africa. So uh, the process of uh, the investigation, it, it, it has to start, start somewhere. And the first thing that an investigator will think about or has to consider when you are investigating a cyber crime is first to assess the situation. So the, the situation being assessing the situation means that um, a crime, can, like when we said that a crime is not, it, it's, it doesn't have boundaries, no limitations. Um, Somebody can be sitting in, say, um, Nigeria and then will commit an, a crime on, say, um, United States or UK. Or somebody can be sitting in, uh, and likewise, come somebody can be sitting in the United States and be committing the crime all across to Nigeria or all across in South Africa and so forth on the, on different, on the both continents. And so when that happens, um, and an investigator is um, trying to investigate this. The first thing is you need to consider if the jurisdiction supports uh, a persecution. So if a person is uh, sitting, like I said, in the United States and commit a crime in Nigeria, or sitting in Nigeria and commit a crime in the United States, 
um, the, uh, the jurisdiction that is it going to allow you to actually persecute the person, wherever that person is, um, is, is staying? And then can the charges be sustained if a guilty uh, verdict is, is, is in place? Uh, you need to consult the prosecutor uh, to gain additional insight into specific uh, specific crime that you are investigating. Um, they usually will uh, track the IP address first, examine the web server log um, inspector, and then um, the emails. They will attempt to retrieve um, uh, deleted evidence and and so forth uh, to that was tried to use um, in the crime. So, um, and then the process, the process will continue um, and it will be to uh, start the initial investigation. And the initial investigation will be, of course, asking that same question when it comes to physical uh, crime. In this case, that's similar, uh, who committed the crime um, or who will be the suspect in place, what crime has been committed, when is this crime committed and where, uh, was this crime committed? Is there a limita limitation to um, jurisdiction, like I mentioned? Uh, what is the evidence? If there is any evidence to collect, where might we physically, uh, where might the physical or digital evidence be, or where will it be located? What type of physical or, or digital evidence uh, were involved in the crime? Does any of the evidence uh, needs to be uh, photographed or preserved immediately. The problem is when um, when in a, an organization without um, a cyber training or without an awareness, when an attack is happening and people start to panic, they unplug the or, or they will turn off the computer, which is a very bad idea because it, it can uh, temper with uh, evidence. So um, it needs to be done by professionals that really understand what you're doing and and um, uh, segmented uh, form to protect the evidence. Um, how can the evidence be preserved? That's what I was talking about to maintain uh, and maintain for court uh, proceedings because these evidence will need to be presented at the court. So if it's destroyed, um, yeah, then you basically don't have a case. Um, so cybercrime tools. So these are just a few. There's so many, many uh, tools that investigators for forensic investigators used to investigate um, when a crime is committed and so i just mentioned a few so the x-ray forensic uh, this is the most complete uh, forensic suit for windows so uh, the job of the forensic aspect is to um, help identify crime and analyze the evidence of course um, that today's uh, forensic analysts um, are capable of recovering data that have been uh, deleted. So um, so when data, some of them will be encrypted or are hidden in the um, fold of um, mobile devices um, technology, they can uh, be called to testify in court and relate the evidence uh, found during the investigation. So the, um, the X-Way forensic uh, the main feature include the ability to perform uh, tax cloning and um, imaging. So it reads petition from raw image uh, files uh, and so forth. So, and then the forensic uh, toolkit um, or um, FTK, it can be used to identify deleted files, um, which uh, I was talking about sometimes when, um, when attackers are being chased around, or they realize that they are being um, followed, um, or a crime has been detected and investigators are in place, they will try to delete delete files um, and so forth. So that tool actually helps you to retrieve that deleted uh, information. So this is just um, this is just I, I actually was thinking of um, getting it to show. Africa and then also uh, back in the US. But this is what I, I found that um, if you look at this map and see the cyber crime that is happening in Africa, and um, this is of course not all of them on the continent, but at least the few that uh, is recorded. If you look at um, all these attacks and, and where they are ranked um, in Kenya, um, 
And then, of course, the standout is it, it's Nigeria. It's facing the most crime um, right now that needs a lot of um, a lot of uh, stuff in place to help mitigate this um, because the rate at which cybercrime is growing um, it's, 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 it's serious. So I just wanted to show this. But um, so the cybercrime in Africa, well, currently, like I said, Interpol, um, Interpol is helping. So sometimes they will be called to investigate this. Um, across borders, um, they they did describe this um, scheme as um, banking and credit card fraud as the most uh, prevalent and processed um, threat in Africa. So currently, that is the main uh, problem that goes on. People will steal um, others' credit card. Um, so Interpol said that in, in 14 countries on the line, the scale of threat. Um, when you take the, the whole continent, less than half, less than 50% uh, or about 50% of the uh, countries on the continent of Africa has anything in place in terms of cybersecurity or in terms of um, any forms of prevention of cybercrime. I personally say uh, cybersecurity is not born in Africa. Um, and so it's a, it's a major problem. Police arrested more than 70 alleged fraudsters uh, linked in Nigeria crime um, network. Uh, the, this crime network is called Black Axe and they, they are in South Africa, um, Nigeria, Ivory Coast, and then there's a few other places that they are located. But um, approximately 90% of African businesses are operating without a necessary cyber uh, security product protocols in place. So this is um, a major problem, okay. Um, so the effect of cyber crime on the continent of Africa, it's just um, a lot, but the, one of the outstanding one is um, opportun um, opportunity of investment. So because there isn't a lot of uh, legislative law in place for cybersecurity in these countries, um, investors, no investor wants to come in and invest because um, attackers sees um, most of these African countries with no cybersecurity um, policies or measures in place, they see them as a low, low hanging fruit. So they will come down on them. So um, that is what, of course, investors um, are afraid of. Um, they are, people are losing a lot of money. Um, this is what, uh, even in, um, it was estimated that um, it cost the South African um, economy 500 and um, 70 million a year uh, dollars. It's, it's that's just a lot of money, and that's just a few mentions. And in Nigeria, yes, you can see that uh, Kenya. Um, so it's it's a problem that is is needs to be um, taken care of as soon. Um, so Africa as a whole is uh, presumed to lose uh, four four billion annually for cybersecurity, and this is uh, probably just. Uh, talking about a few, not the whole continent. The whole continent probably will be more than that. The current state of uh, cybersecurity in Africa. So, cybercrime and cybersecurity act uh, 2021. Um, this was uh, put in place in 2021 in South Africa. There's also a National Information Technology Development Agency in Nigeria. And then in Ghana, there's a Cybersecurity Act that was um, 2020. Uh, and then um, Morocco also has um, one also in place. So when you when you look at it statistically, like I was saying, um, very few countries um, on the continent has anything in place in terms of cybersecurity. All right. Um, this is just a, a few um, lessons, but of course, there's more things that we can uh, put in place. But in reflection, when we think of lesson learned, um, if we walk our steps back, if you put in place all the, um, at least all the preventive measures that uh, that I mentioned uh, uh, from the beginning, cybersecurity um, needs to be uh, practiced in Africa and Nigeria. 
And if we put all those um, measures in place um, in terms of prevention, that will help a lot uh, to mitigate the cybersecurity problems. And of course, because cybersecurity is not born, that's just my personal opinion, but because it's not born, um, Security awareness training, I believe, is the number one thing right now on the continent that um, the continent of Africa needs. Um, it, it, people need to be aware what cybersecurity is about, what needs to be put in place to help reduce the risk. And then organizations will be able to learn, individuals will be able to learn. And of course, uh, the government as a whole, because it affects, it, it affects everybody. And so, it's when it comes to um, uh, small organizations and media, um, main organizations, the problem is the fact that many organizations are still using outdated or, or in many cases, uh, printed software, uh, printed, um, sorry, pirated um, softwares. And so nearly one quarter of the um, uh, users in, South, uh, in Africa are currently using uh, operating systems like uh, um, Windows XP. That was first released in 2001. So you can imagine the risks that this is associated with. So that is just a few that um, I think, I believe that with um, a good security awareness training, um, on the continent, people will be more aware and then we can start to implement uh, preventive measures. In summary, as a type of cyber crime becomes increasingly sophisticated, so does the share value of associated threat and financial loss. Um, on a more uh, granular level, uh, cyber crime runs rampant in many people's homes, uh, personal computer. Um, and then um, as the African continent economy move, moves online, citizens and their computer systems and uh, continent's information technology infrastructure becomes enticing um, our target to an increasingly professional um, cadre of, of um, cyber criminals. The growth of cyber crime is um, no means just an African problem. The future impact of cyber crime looks to be a, um, a pivoted economic driver and a massive call to action for cybersecurity companies and countries that host them. Cybersecurity uh, venture predicts the global cost of cyber crime will continue to grow by 15% a year over the next uh, five years, reaching 10.5 trillion in annual damages in 2025. All right, uh, that will be the end. This is the references that I use um, for more information. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Sheila. That was very um, resourceful. I have a couple of questions for you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have quite a couple of questions for you. Um, least privilege. Yes. How can you explain the concept of a least privilege and uh, how can it help prevent cybercrime? <laughs> so a uh, least privilege is, um, so a good example is, for instance, a customer service at a company. Uh, let me start to define it that way. A customer service at an organization, given an information or have access to um, accounts information. It doesn't make sense, right? So if you work in a customer service or UI front desk person, person, there's no need for you to have access to the organization's financial information. That is least privilege. So least privilege means that based on your job duty or based on your job title, what you need to perform your job that is the information or that is the data assets that needs to be granted to you. You don't need more, you don't need less. That helps an organization to protect um, its data and, and prevent these attacks. Because when people have too much access and they are not able to even understand why they have those assets, um, attackers can use that so, that's, um, easy access and get to the main 
organizations network and, and attack it. That's good. And uh, because most insider attack that happen is because people abuse those privileges. Exactly. You know, once they have a privilege and they, they leave, they can escalate and uh, abuse it. So that's good. I have other exactly. questions. How can people stop, step up, stay up to date on the latest trend and the best practices in cyber crime prevention and investigation? Did you get the question? Yes, I did. I, I did. Up to date on the trend. Yeah. Yes, I did. And um, I think, well, I just go back one more when you said insider threat. Insider threat is well, well, one biggest problem that is very difficult to, to catch. So when the person actually attacked from inside, it's, it's much tougher to attack them. And yes, to your next question, there's so many, um, there's so many ways that um, an organization or individual can stay current. There's always annual reports that is released. Um, by major um, cyber organized cyber security organization uh, based on the, the threats that um, is, is, is happening. Currently, um, once around recently, I had um, a presentation that I did at my workplace on uh, predictions. So beginning of the year, even some of the reports actually give predictions of what we can look forward to beginning of the year. Um, one, um, one of few stuff that I also use to stay current, of course, is OWASP uh, top 10. So that that gives you like um, real time um, statistics or, or current attacks and tactics that attackers are using. What are the main, um, what are the specific um, um, types of attacks that is happening currently? Um, OWASP top 10 will give you that. Um, even MITRE attack, I, I, I believe I, um, it's also a very good one. MITRE attack actually help organization to actually map um, what an attacker can use and how far an attacker can go. And then what you, the organization can do to prevent, at which level do you want to prevent uh, the att that attack from happening? So uh, those are some of the things, but there's so many um, current information that, um, that are available. There's always newsletters um, that is released and so forth. Yeah, I agree with you because once you you know the OWAS top 10 and you actually understand the matter attack, you understand the TTP, the techniques and the, the tech, what they, how they uh, carry out the operations. Mm -hmm. So it's good to always go to the website, get the latest trend and uh, stay up to date. I still have a couple of questions for you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask, how can organization, right, balance the need for security with the need for convenience and the ease of use? You understand? And when it comes to authentication and access control. Okay. Uh, I, I, yes. yes. I, I believe it all, the starting point of that is uh, security awareness training. Um, when an organization is able to train um, users for them to understand and awareness training, um, there has been few places that I have been where uh, the awareness training from say 2005 is the same one that we are doing in 2015, which makes no sense. So the organization needs to be current when it comes to presenting an awareness training. And based on the users and their ages, you present the awareness training that will be um, interactive. So if the awareness training is interactive, it makes it easier for um, the users to understand um, what is expected um, and why they are doing this awareness training. And when uh, um, users are understand, in understanding of what the risk is out there, they will not have any problem when it comes to um, what is expected of them in terms of acceptable use. Um, if a person has to use their own, uh, bring your own device, for instance, they have to use their own um, device to work. Or if an organization assigned um, a device like a cell phone, company cell phone to a person, and you are made aware that, okay, you cannot go to this website, you cannot because um, it's not acceptable. First, 
awareness training will make the user understand and also putting measures actually in place because of course you always get the bad nuts that will no matter what some want to do it anyway so you need to actually um explain to them and put the restrictions in place that okay if the person is sitting at a workplace and using a computer they cannot go to youtube for instance or they cannot go to instagram on a company computer if so if you block it and they try to even get there the configuration or your setup will prevent that from happening and also getting you attacked um so it, it's all about um, making the employees or the users aware i believe will make things easier I have one more question. Why we get um, Pastor Victor to prepare for his presentation? Okay, and uh, the question is, what are some of the biggest emerging trends in the field of cybersecurity, and how do you stay ahead of them? Well, so currently, depending on um, depending on the season that we are in, uh, remember when. Um, when COVID hit, uh, it was uh, around COVID. So depending on the situation that is occurring right now, that is what attackers will use to utilize that, that process. So I always say like when we get to election season, it's that season and it's, that is the trend. That is going to be the trend that attackers are going to be using. Um, recently at where, um, at where I live, um, the trend was attackers was going through churches, which is uh, very funny. So they go through, yes, they go through churches, get um, the private information, and then they will contact people privately and then trick them, get their information, and then they will start to steal. So I, the, my personal opinion is attackers are now going to the lowest ground and going to the highest ground. Ransomware is the trend and it's, it has always been and is the biggest um, issue. Um, most IT department hates to even hear the name ransomware, but that is the problem and um, it is what it is. You just have to get ready for it. Make sure that all your measures are in place, your backups and so forth. But basically when it comes to trend, I personally see it to be things that are depending on what is happening the current things that is happening is what um attackers usually will use to attack um attack um uh, individuals or organizations so people need to be aware if something major is happening um in the system in the company or in the country you just have to be aware and realize that okay this can be used by attackers if it has to do with health attackers are going to be jumping on it if it has to do with election attackers are going to use that no matter how sudden the situation is people still want to use that to um take advantage of um individuals organizations and so forth so yeah you mentioned it was sad that reminds me during in covid yes. in the states some threat actors we are Actually, sending ransomware to hospitals, you know, and uh, encrypt data, and they were asked to pay ransom. It's yes. so sad that in that situation, people could actually attack uh, hospitals. Thank yes. you very much. I would like to introduce the next speaker. He's the barrister Victor. He's a legal a practitioner and managing counsel at law practice in Lagos, Nigeria. He shall speak on the tools for prosecution in Nigeria. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you to the whole audience. Um, Sheila, I want to thank you for your fantastic and wonderful presentation. You've laid the foundation for me to discuss elaborately on prosecution of cyber crimes and the tools required for effective prosecution. So I'll quickly share my slide. Okay, I'll be speaking on um, topic cybercrime in Nigeria, tools for investigation, prevention, and prosecution. And I'll be focusing more on prosecution as my colleague Sheila has done a fantastic job on investigation okay. and prevention. So Frank has introduced me already, so I won't go any further on that. I'll go to the next page of my slide. 
Okay, we go to the concept of cybercrime. So the advancement in technology has gained general acceptance, which has made use of computer systems almost inevitable in our world today. Of course, this is obvious. We're in a digital age now. Everyone has gone digital. So computers are as essential as possible. Technology and internet-based activities have continued to grow in Nigeria, the world as a whole. It is attendant impacts, both positive and negative. Of course, the use of computers have had huge positive impact on the world. At the same time, cybercrime has been the order of the day by virtue of the use of computer systems. As the number of internet illiterate persons continues to diminish, the users and citizens of the cyberspace apparently increase in the same proportion, thus expanding the prospect for exploiting cyberspace technology. So in essence, as the users of the internet and computers increase, so also do cyber criminals as well. So that's that in some way. Over the past two decades, the cyber crime has been under continuous, the cyberspace has been under continuous siege and attack from cyber criminals. Cyber crime with its um with its um and borderless nature presents colossal on unimaginable danger to global survival. Cybercrime is a very difficult phenomenon. And as Sheila pointed out, the huge economic effects it's had on the world as whole, well, it's unimaginable. Africa in particular, we saw some statistics that says Africa lost $4 trillion, which is quite fascinating. And by 2025, the world will lose about $10.5 trillion which is unbelievable. So it's something we need to take very seriously. Okay, we'll go to further on conceptualization. Cyber crime is a term used to describe two distinct but closely related criminal activities, cyber dependent and cyber enabled crimes. Of course, cyber crime has two key facets. It's, based, it's cyber based, it's cyber dependent as well. So the internet provides a means by which criminals carry out all these malicious activities. The scope of cyber crimes is both national and transnational, cutting across several nations and continents by the nature of cyberspace as a worldwide system. Of course, the cyberspace is not limited to Nigeria, Africa alone, it's a worldwide thing. And cyber crime, of course, cuts across nations and the world as a whole. It's an example given by Sheila earlier. Someone with a computer in Nigeria, for example, could defraud somebody in the USA or Canada or Cote d'Ivoire, anywhere else in the world. So it's not just a national thing, it's, it's a transnational thing, and it's something the world has to take very importantly. Then we'll do a bit of more definition as per the Council of Europe's Convention on Cyber Crimes 2001 where cybercrime is used as an umbrella term to refer to an array of criminal activities, including offenses against computer data and systems, computer-related offenses, content of offenses, and copyright offenses. I'll go to the next place in my slide. More on conceptualization of cybercrime. The same convention as earlier mentioned covers cybercrime in four main categories including offenses against the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of computer data and systems, such as illegal access, illegal interceptions, data or system interference, and illegal devices. Computer-related offenses like computer-related forgery and computer-related fraud. Content-related offenses like child pornography, etc as well as offenses related to infringement of copyright and related rights. So cybercrime, like you see, is very broad. It's not limited to just a particular area. It's as expansive as you can imagine. All that is key is the use of a computer and a computer system to perpetrate any crime of any nature. That's defined as a cybercrime. I'll go to the next page of my slide. That's cybercrime in Nigeria. In Nigeria, Digitalization and internet-based activities have grown exponentially over the years. Of course, the world has seen a very massive growth in the use of computer systems, and Nigeria has not been left behind. 
Internet expansion has had beneficial effects on the country's developments, particularly in government, commerce, education, entertainment, banking, and all other facets of the nation's economy. Nigeria has seen a lot of growth by virtue of the use of computers and the computer system and the internet. And this has been felt particularly in the management of government, in commerce, in business, in education, entertainment, of course. We know Nigeria is one of the entertainment powerhouses in the world, in banking as well, and other faces of the nation's economy. So Nigeria has seen a very huge positive impact as per the use of computer systems. However, the downside can be seen in the increase in cyber crimes and other related activities. Just as cyber systems have been used to improve the nation's economy as a whole, we've seen a downside as cyber crime has increased proportionally. So this is a very big concern. I'll go to the next page of my slide. We'll go to types of cyber crimes because it's good for us to have an idea what these cyber crimes are and typical examples of what they are. Common cyber crimes include hacking, sending of malicious spam emails, phishing, cyber bullying, cyber squatting, cyber stalking, cyber terrorism, identity theft, credit card fraud, content related offenses, data interference, illegal interception, illegal data acquisition, trademark copyright related offenses, virus malware and ransomware, denial of service attacks, ATM manipulations, ETC. You can see it's very broad. There are a lot of crimes that can be committed that can be termed as cyber crimes. Like I said before, what is key is use of a computer and a computer system. And all kinds of crimes can be committed with this. Cyber crimes can be performed across jurisdictions. Since a cyber criminal can use a computer in Nigeria to perform a crime in a foreign country, of course, we've stressed on that. I'll go to the next page of my slide. Then I would go to punishment and penalty for cyber crime. Because of course, um, we're talking about prosecution of cyber criminals, but first and foremost, we, may, we must know for there to be prosecution, there has to be a penalty upon conviction. So we want to give us a brief understanding of what some of the penalties are as prescribed by Nigerian law on cyber crime. On hacking, I'll give you a bit of definition. Simply put, is the act of a person, a group of persons, illegally accessing another person's computer. Of course, this is self-explanatory. Section 6 of the Cyber Crimes Prevention and Prohibition Act of 2015 criminalizes hacking and provides for various degrees of fines and imprisonment for, the, for various degrees of hacking. So, of course, hacking has various degrees and levels. So, it depends on the level of hacking that will determine the amount of punishment that will be meted to those convicted. And the punishment is not limited to only imprisonment. It also includes fines as well. It all depends on the level of hacking. The next is cyber stalking slash bullying. Cyber stalking is the intentional act of sending a message, which is grossly offensive. We can be pornographic or of an indecent, obscene or menacing character from one person to another through electronic means or sending a false message for the purpose of causing annoyance, inconvenience, danger, obstruction, insult or needless anxiety to another because cyber stalking is another very broad term and can be elaborated and expansive of course we've seen the elements of cyber stalking and bullying pornographic content indecent obscene or menacing characters of course these are also part of cyber stalking and bullying i will go a bit further in defining cyber bullying which is when a person intentionally transmits or causes the transmission of any communication through a computer system to threaten or harass another person, or where such communication places another person in fear of death, violence, or bodily harm, or any threat to harm the property or reputation of the addressee or another, or the reputation of a deceased person 
or any threat to accuse the addressee or any other person of a crime to extort from the person, firm, association, or corporation any money or other thing. Cyberbullying, of course, is a very, very fact. The, the law is totally against that. And you can imagine even um, reputation of a deceased person can be termed cyberbullying. So it does not just limit to people that are living. Someone who is not alive can be bullied as well, can be, can be a victim of cyberbullying. So of course, the law is very expansive on this point to ensure it's all encompassing and ensures everyone who is guilty of something related to this can be captured under this legal provision. Section 24 of the Cyber Crimes Act 2015 extensively covers for offenses of this nature and penalties as well. I'll go to the next page of my slide, cyber terrorism. It can be defined as deliberate use of a computer or computer systems to cause an atmosphere of fear amongst the general populace by threatening the use of violence or threatening to intimidate or actually intimidate the government or destruction of an information system. Cyber terrorism may occur in several forms, which can also include disinformation. So this is a very, very critical issue facing Nigeria and the world as a whole. Terrorism now is not limited to just the usual use of violence, maybe bombs and guns and all of that. It also entails terrorism that is internet-based, that is computer-based. So cyber terrorism is a very, very big issue. We see situations where terrorist groups have used the internet to try to recruit members, try to indoctrinate people to buy into their views. This is cyber terrorism, and this is a very big thing that is even affecting the nation as a whole. As per the legal provision, Section 18 of the Cyber Crimes Act 2015 defines cyber terrorism and prescribes its sentence of life imprisonment. It is worthy of note that the more appropriate and robust legislation on cyber crime terrorism is the Terrorism Prevention Act 2011. I will throw more light on this particular line. The Cyber Crimes Act, of course, provides for life imprisonment as punishment for someone found guilty of cyber terrorism, which is life sentence is one of the gravest punishments. Of course, um, death, of course, capital punishment, of course, is number one. But of course, we can see most countries in the world, Nigeria as well, is trying as much as possible to phase out from um, ascribing death penalty for offenses. But, a life imprisonment shows the government of this offense. This is an offense that the law is totally against because it has an effect to even destroy a nation as a whole. To show how critical and how critical this provision is, the law provides for life imprisonment for cyber terrorism. It's also worthy of note that it's the Terrorism Prevention Act of 2011 that is a specialized legislation on terrorism as a whole. So of course, this provision and this law in collaboration with the Cyber Crimes Act of 2015 coming together will provide for more than adequate punishment for someone found guilty of cyber terrorism. I'll go to the next page of my slide. Fishing and spamming. I'll give a bit of a definition as well. This means a criminal and fraudulent process of attempting to acquire sensitive information, such as usernames, passwords, and credit card details by masquerading as a trustworthy entity in an electronic communication through emails or instant messaging, either in form of an email from what appears from your bank asking a user to change his or her password or reveal his or her identity so that such information can later be used to defraud the user. Section 32 of the Cyber Crimes Prevention and Prohibition Act 2015 provides a penalty of three years imprisonment or a fine of one million naira or both. Phishing and spamming are, very, are two very prevalent cyber crimes Nigerians experience on a daily. 
We see all kinds of fraudulent messages and emails from unknown persons requesting for credit card details, asking for your username, password. And if by chance you fall victim to this, of course, the person would, the effect will be unexplainable, unimaginable. I've had people that have had experiences and most times they lost everything they had. So people advise most times that even the banks also advise customers as well not to send their credit card details and information to any persons, even if the demand were made from the bank itself. So you can see this is a very, very conscious effort by everyone to ensure this particular cyber crime, which is the most prevalent in Nigeria, is properly tackled. I would now go down to ATM slash POS manipulation. Of course, you know what ATM is. Um, POS is um, point of sale terminals. It's something that is very common in Nigeria here, where people, it's like a, of course, you know what a POS is, like a small machine where you insert your credit card. And of course, you can obtain cash by the POS vendor or POS user. So we see situations where these ATM machines and POS terminals are manipulated by people in a bid to defraud others. I have some personal friends who don't use their cards at POS points because they have this consistent fear that their information will be stolen and their money is taken from them. In a sense, they will be defrauded. So this is a very prevalent crime in Nigeria here. As noted by the Cyber Crimes Act, it is not uncommon, and in some circumstances, for staff of financial institutions such as banks to connive with criminal elements to perpetrate such an offense. So, for example, most of these POS terminals are issued by banks. And sometimes we see some of these bank workers collaborating with these criminals to manipulate these POS machines, and the negative effect has been felt over time. So, the law has come in. By, by virtue of Section 30, Subsection 1 and 2 of the Cyber Crimes Prohibition and Prevention Act of 2015, to prescribe punishment of imprisonment for up to five years and a fine of five million in an ordinary case, and up to seven years and imprisonment of imprisonment for staff of financial institutions who connive and are accomplices to crimes of this nature. So the law envisaging that financial institutions and bank officials can, and of course, can be useful con conduits for the perpetration of crimes of this nature, have even prescribed a harsher penalty for such persons who have been given that privileged position by virtue of their office. And if they, by virtue of that, take advantage of their customers and defraud them through ATM or POS manipulations, they will suffer a harsher penalty if found guilty under these offenses. I will go now to cyber spotting. This occurs when a person registers or sells a domain name not belonging to him or her with the intention of making profit from the good of another person. The typical example is where an offender may procure a popular domain name with plans to resell it in the future. Section 25, subsection 2 and 3 of the Cyber Crimes Prevention and Prohibition Act 2015 provides a penalty and fine of imprisonment, it provides for a penalty and fine and imprisonment and the return of the trademark to the rightful owner. This cyber spotting is a very interesting area because um, we, the cyber space, if you want to have um, a web page, for example, you need to go procure a domain name. You've seen situations where people buy domain names that are similar to already existing names. Of course, to get a domain name, most times it's tied to a trademark. For example, Coca-Cola.com. Of course, Coca-Cola is a brand, is a trademark, and Coca-Cola.com is a domain name most likely Coca-Cola will use to sell its products. So you can imagine somebody going to purchase the domain name coca coal without the a dot com a an ignorant person may assume it's coca-cola.com and log in thinking they may be like a promo or something that coca-cola is doing and then the person gets defrauded very quickly so the law has envisaged a situation of this nature 
and has made adequate provision by virtue of section 25, subsection 2 and 3. So because the law, like it's rightly pointed, is a, to, to prevent and prohibit. Of course, it also provides a punishment. But the idea is to prevent and prohibit cyber crimes. And the law by virtue of section 25 has seen a crime of this nature as something that will be prevalent and has made adequate provisions to ensure is prevented. And in the case of someone found guilty, the person will either pay a fine and also face imprisonment or both, and also be told to return the trademark to the rightful owner. The next point is identity theft, which is the wrongful use of the personal data of somebody by another person with the intent of committing fraud and deception for economic gain. The law, once again, by virtue of Section 22, that's the Cyber Crime Prevention and Prohibition Act 2015, provides punishment of fine and imprisonment and or both for someone found guilty of this offense. Impersonation exists where a person pretends to be another person with the purpose of defrauding a third party. This is punishable under Section 22.3 of the Act with five, five years imprisonment or a fine of 7 million naira. This is a very, very important point I want to also make impersonation identity theft. You see, people pose as people they are not and end up defrauding people. This is a very prevalent thing, particularly in Nigeria here. And our laws have been put in place to ensure its prevention and prohibition. And to ensure also that if someone is found guilty of such an offense, person is, of course, punished adequately. The law provides for a five-year imprisonment and a fine of seven million as well. Then um, I was giving examples of cyber crimes and punishment, and I made reference to the Cyber Crime Pre Prohibition and Prevention ETC Act of 2015. I'm sure when I was making reference to that law, it seemed like maybe what kind of law is this? So I took out time to also provide for legal and regulatory slash institutional framework for cyber crime prosecution in Nigeria. As the caption goes, the laws have to be in place. If there's no law to provide for an offense, then there's no offense. There's no law, there's no offense. So the law has to be put in place to provide for an offense. That is the basis upon which, of course, there will be an investigation and a prosecution if found guilty. The primary legislation for cyber crime in Nigeria is the Cyber Crimes Prohibition Prevention ETC Act of 2015. This is a primary, this is the main legislation on cyber crime in Nigeria. We have other legislations, we call secondary legislation. These are laws, of course, that are also preventing, are there to prevent cyber crime, but are not specifically on cyber crime compared to the Cyber Crimes Prevention and Prohibition Act of 2015. Some of these, some of these laws include the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission Establishment Act of 2004, commonly known as the EFCC Act. Of course, the EFCC was established by a legislation so this law also provides for how the EFCC should work, how the investigation should be carried out. It basically establishes the, this agency to fight against economic and financial crimes, particularly as they relate to cyber crimes. Also, we have the Advanced Fee Fraud and Other Related Offenses Act of 2006. Of course, this law is there. Advanced fee fraud is, of course, internet-based most times, and this law is there to prevent, to prohibit, and to punish offenders if found guilty under this provision. We have the Money Laundering Prohibition Act of 2011. We have the Criminal Code Act. We have the Penal Code Act. These particular laws, as the Criminal Code and the Penal Code, provide for, these acts provide for crimes generally. So anything crime in Nigeria, the main legislation is the criminal code. And the criminal code is as per the southern part of the nation. Whereas the penal code covers the northern part of the nation. These are the two primary criminal laws that regulate crimes in Nigeria as per law enforcement. So like I said before, the criminal code is for the southern part of Nigeria, while the penal code is for the northern part of Nigeria. 
these are the two principal laws on crime in Nigeria and investigation, of course, prosecution and all of that. The law provides for punishment as well for crimes generally, not specifically cyber crime, because cyber crime is a crime. So by virtue of that, these two laws are very critical as well. Then we have the Terrorism Prevention Act 2003. We have all the legislation that are there to provide for the prosecution and investigation of cyber crimes in Nigeria. I'll go to my next slide. Um, then we go to the regulatory frameworks. Regulators are these institutions that have been established to fight against this phenomenon, against this menace that is eating deep into the nation and the world as large. So I will give a few of these um, institutions. Of course, the first and foremost and the most important is the EFCC, the Economic and Financial Crimes Act. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. This is um, an institution that was established in 2004 in a bid to tackle economic and financial crimes in Nigeria, which has been a very serious issue over the years. Nigeria has um, experienced a lot of financial and economic crimes perpetrated by government officials, private individuals, and what have you. So the EFCC as a body has been charged with the responsibility of investigating, prosecuting cyber crimes generally in Nigeria. Then we have the Nigerian police force. Of course, Nigerian police force is um, there to prevent crime, investigate and prosecute when needed. But this is as per crime generally not as against the EFCC that is specifically in economic and financial crimes. Nigerian police force is empowered to investigate all kinds of crimes generally, irrespective of the nature. But if it's a specific crime, for example, cyber crime, the police can either investigate themselves or send it to the EFCC, which is a more specialized body and that is more equipped to investigate and prosecute crimes of this nature. We have the National Identity Management Commission, NIMC. And this body was established to collate and collect data of Nigerians. And um, if you have a phone number in Nigeria, for example, you must have it linked to your, they call it National Identity Identification Number, NIN. That NIN is issued by the NIMC. So if any cyber crime is committed, we can use the person's phone number, the person's identi identification card details or information. So because all these things are tied together, with one information, we can be able to get information on other areas to ensure cyber criminals are traced and are easily arrested. Um, this NIMC is a very, very critical body and um, is a very, very useful intervention by the government to curb cyber crime in Nigeria, particularly. At the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit, NIFU, this body is basically on financial intelligence. And of course, most of these financial, most of these financial crimes are tied to the cyber space and cyber crimes as well. So this institution is a very important one and they play a critical role in the prosecution of cyber crimes in Nigeria. We have the special control unit against money laundering. Of course, it's a very important body as well to, to prevent money laundering as well in Nigeria. I'll go to my next slide. Then I will go. To, this is the meat of this of this topic. This is the crux of the topic: prosecution of cyber crimes in Nigeria and the importance of evidence. Um, prior to prosecuting a suspect of cyber crime, a thorough investigation is carried out to ensure the relevant elements of the crime are present, as well as cogent, viable, relevant, and admissible evidence are available for fruitful prosecution. If a cyber criminal is arrested on the suspicion of crime, I suspicion because of Nigerian laws say a person is deemed innocent until proven guilty. So a person arrested is just in a mere suspicion. 
the person is innocent until the court of law convicts the person, such a person, of that offense. So for that conviction to happen, there must be a prosecution process. And for it to prosecute, the prosecutor has to do his homework, which is very pertinent, very important. And what is most important is evidence gathering. Evidence is a very broad term, which includes documents, testimony, oral testimonies or witnesses, and anything that is useful that will help the prosecution team to effectively and efficiently prosecute a crime in Nigeria. The importance of the evidence of evidence generally, as well as total compliance with the provisions of the Evidence Act 2011, cannot be overemphasized. Nigeria has an Evidence Act that was promulgated in 2011, and this act provides for evidence generally, how evidence will be gathered and how it can be admissible in court during the trial and the prosecution process of a cyber criminal. In prosecuting crimes in Nigeria generally, two key considerations are the burden of proof and the standard of proof. The burden of proof means on who lies the onus to prove a cyber crime. Our Nigerian law says, of course, generally also says, he who alleges must prove. So the prosecution is alleging that this so-called cyber criminal or alleged cyber criminal committed a cyber crime. It could be phishing, spamming, cyber terrorism, whatever the cyber crime is. The burden of proof, the owner to prove the crime and the offense lies solely on the prosecution. That's the person alleging the offense. So it's important to get that right. The burden of proof lies solely on the prosecution. The defendant who is the so-called or suspected cyber criminal has a burden just to defend only when the prosecution has discharged the burden of proof on it. And the burden of proof is strictly and is permanently on the prosecution. When they discharge the burden of proof on them, of course, the defense will now be entitled to put up a defense to weaken, of course, the evidence provided by the prosecution. Secondly, is the standard of proof. What I mean by standard of proof? Standard of proof means the quality or quantity of evidence and this, I use the word standard requirement for you to effectively prosecute a criminal in Nigeria. And in criminal offenses in Nigeria, criminal cases generally, the standard of proof is beyond reasonable doubt. What does that mean? A prosecution team that wants to prove that a cyber criminal committed a cyber crime have to prove to the judge or the adjudicator that the cyber criminal committed the cyber crime beyond reasonable doubt. He must put in the judge's mind that there is no doubt at all that this supposed or alleged cyber criminal committed the offense, cyber crime. The judge must be convinced beyond all reasonable doubt. That is the standard of proof in criminal offenses, including cyber crimes in Nigeria. I'll go to my next slide. I mentioned this before the Nigerian law, a person charged with an offense is deemed innocent until proven guilty. Thus, the burden, onus of proving a cyber crime lies solely on the prosecuting authority who prefer the charge against the accused person slash defendant. Who can be the prosecuting authority here? Like I mentioned before, the EFCC, Nigerian police. These are prosecuting authorities that the ones that would gather the evidence required, that have done the investigation, and have gathered all the evidence required to prosecute and prove beyond reasonable doubt that the accused person or the alleged cyber criminal is indeed guilty of the offense as contained in the charge. The charge, of course, is provides for the offense committed by the person, the time it was committed, and under what law 
that offense is prohibited. I also mentioned earlier, the standard of proof in the prosecution of a cyber crime in Nigeria is proof beyond reasonable doubt. The failure of the prosecution to discharge the burden and standard of proof during the prosecution of a cyber crime will likely lead to the discharge and acquittal of the accused person. So you can see how important it is for the prosecution to carry out these two important functions to ensure the, the owners, the burden of proof on them is discharged one, and to ensure the standard is beyond reasonable doubt. These are two critical factors. If this is not established and are not done properly by the prosecution team, of course, there will not be, there won't be a conviction, definitely not. And the alleged criminal, the alleged cyber criminal will go scotch free. So you can imagine someone who actually committed a cyber crime and because of the lapse or the ineptitude of the prosecution team to effectively prosecute the person, and they make some certain mistakes or their lapses in their case. And these lapses are hinged on by the defense and his lawyer, the defense and his counsel, and therefore cause a reasonable doubt in the mind of the judge. That is enough for the so-called or alleged cyber criminal to be acquitted. Because like I said before, the judge has to be convinced beyond reasonable doubt. So this is very critical. This is very, very important. For effective prosecution, the prosecution must do a very, very good job to gather evidence and everything required to ensure the prosecution is effective and efficient. Okay, before I go to challenges in prosecuting cyber crimes in Nigeria, I want to talk a bit more on evidence generally. Um, of course, for a prosecution to discharge the burden of proof and standard of proof imposed on him by the law to ensure a, an alleged cyber criminal is convicted appropriately, he must ensure he gathers his evidence. It is very, very important. Evidence is everything in, in the Nigerian um, legal system. If you want to ensure you win a case, be it a criminal case or a civil case or any kind of case at all, evidence is everything. And I would, I did mention earlier, yeah, I think in the slide, I think my slide 13, I'll just go back to it a bit. I used the words cogent, viable, relevant, and admissible evidence. I will speak on relevant and admissible evidence. Under Nigerian law, for an evidence to be admitted, for an, element, for an evidence to be useful in prosecuting an alleged cyber criminal, the evidence must be relevant to the case. For example, a prosecution, a prosecution authority, a prosecutor, that's a person prosecuting, bringing evidence that is not in any way related to a cyber crime. For example, now someone is alleged to have committed um, phishing or spamming, for example, or POS manipulation, for example. And the prosecution is bringing evidence that is related to the cyber terrorism, for example. It is not in any way tied or relevant to the charge preferred against the accused person. So that evidence is as good as worthless because the offense you charge him for is cyber is spamming or fish and or and fishing. And here you are providing evidence on cyber terrorism, which is totally irrelevant to the offense in question. So it's very important that evidence is relevant. The Evidence Act also provides clearly Evidence Act of 2011, that's the Nigerian legislation that is that provides for evidence generally in Nigeria, says also that evidence for it to be useful and admitted in court must be relevant to the case before the court. So relevance is very important and it can be, can be taken for granted. It's very, very critical. One also very critical area is admissibility. 
evidence must be admissible. If, if, an, if an evidence is relevant in the case, but it's not admissible in the case, it's worthless, basically. It is it's not useful. It's relevant, of course, but the court cannot admit it. Admi admitting evidence, in essence, means the court accepting the evidence and the relying on it to convict the alleged cyber criminal. So the evidence must be admitted. If it's not admitted by the court, then the court can't place reliance on it to convict the person. And the evidence is what you will use to prove the crime itself. So without evidence being admitted, no matter how beautiful the evidence is, or how relevant it is, or how properly arranged or packaged it is, if it's not admitted in court, it's not useful. And admissibility is very critical. I want to make reference to a particular section of the Evidence Act, Section 84.1 of the Evidence Act in Nigeria 2011. This is, this evidence is as per computer-generated evidence. Of course, you know cyber crimes, uh, crimes are committed with the use of computer system and the cyberspace. So therefore, most of the evidence gathered as per a cyber crime would be evidence generated from the computer. The said Section 84 of the Evidence Act provides for admissibility of evidence generated by a computer. The section is admissibility of computer generated evidence. So this is a very, very critical section on cyber crime prosecution in Nigeria. So for example, the said provision states that the said computer in question that was used to commit the crime and the information gotten from the computer must be certified in a certain manner. Certified as in you must give information of the computer, when the information was printed, it was a document that was printed to prove the crime, when it was printed, how it was printed. You have to give details of the printer which was used to print it, if these things are not in place, that evidence won't be admissible, no matter how relevant it is. Because the law clearly states in Section 84 that of the Evidence Act that such evidence must pass the test provided for in that section, wherein you must provide the information as per the computer, the manner it was printed, the printer, and other relevant things as provided for in that section. For want of time, I will not read through that section because the provisions are quite long, but it lists some certain criteria that have to be met before a computer-generated evidence can, can be admitted in court. So it's very important for the prosecution team to understand these provisions and ensure they certify these documents and the evidence they want to use to ensure they are admitted in court as evidence to convict an alleged person. So a person may be guilty of an, of an offense. I won't say guilty, but guilty in terms of the person really committed the offense. There is no doubt. But because of the laxity on the part of the prosecution team to not effectively prosecute the case, for example, not bringing evidence that is not admissible in court. Evidence is, is the evidence is true, it's correct, but they think the prosecution not complying with the law for the evidence to be admissible would make it a wasted venture. That evidence is as good as useless. So it's very important this provision is taken into cognizance when prosecuting cyber crimes in Nigeria. Then I've got the challenges in prosecuting cyber crimes in Nigeria. Of course, um, cyber crimes, when being prosecuted, we face a lot of challenges. Uh, there was some statistic given by Sheila, my colleague earlier, about Nigeria losing $500 million um, by virtue of cyber crimes and the negative effect it has had on investments in the country. So potential investors are scared that Nigeria is a, is a fertile ground for cyber crime and this is not something good for the nation. So for the challenges that affect prosecution of cyber crimes in Nigeria, will be mentioned. So we can also prefer ways in which we can make the prosecution more effective. You must know your challenges before you know how to tackle them. The challenges are there so we can know 
means and ways upon which you can tackle them. Some of the challenges include anonymity of the cyber criminal. One of the major impediments of the cyber of the prosecution of cyber crime is the identification of the cyber criminal. The challenge of anonymity of a cyber criminal renders the prosecution of a cyber crime ineffective in Nigeria. For example, you can't identify the person that committed this offense. So how then can you prosecute? How then can you effect an arrest? So it's very, very important to identify the person. And this is a very big challenge we are facing in this country. But I believe um, with time, we will have very good improvements on it. Um, statistics have shown, and of course, it's replete in the media of the progress experienced in Nigeria as per prosecution and tackling of cyber crimes generally. And with the improvements in technology, um, of course, we see also effect very important and useful changes. Then I have just 20 minutes, I'll just put it around up. Um, we'll talk of jurisdiction and extradition. Um, of course, we know extradition is, of course, to send the alleged cyber criminals to a jurisdiction for effective prosecution. We know what jurisdiction is as well. So jurisdiction is the place where the cyber criminal or alleged cyber criminal will be tried for the offenses committed. Um, I will then go to my next slide. Absence of proper training of personnel and motivation. This has a rate of poor infrastructure, facilities, poor remuneration, recruitment of unqualified personnel, nepotism, and some other factors. So, of course, it's important to have people that are qualified and have the proper training to carry out the prosecution of cyber crimes in Nigeria. It's someone who is not um, abreast with what the Nigerian laws are, particularly the Evidence Act, going to prosecute a crime will make some basic mistakes. And that would, of course, have a negative effect on the prosecution of a cyber crime. Lack of computer forensic standards, enforcement of legislation. We have a lot of laws. I gave a list of um, laws that um, provide for um, cyber security in Nigeria. We have a lot of them, but one of our biggest challenges is implementation and enforcement of these laws. So it's something that's a work in progress. Um, then poor internet infrastructure, access and coverage. Of course, cyber crime is an internet-based offense. And so in Nigeria, we have a lot of issues with internet connection and access as well as coverage. So this has also has a very, very, um, um, very effective one. Then I would go to recommendations. This is where I will end up. Um, to improve the prosecution of cyber crimes in Nigeria, the following I recommended amongst others, um, there is a need for the laws to be amended to accommodate more novel internet-based crimes that are becoming more and more sophisticated. Law enforcement agencies, uh, prosecutors and investigators need to be proactive. There must be trainings and improved welfare for them as well. Then we have continuous enlightenment of internet users by the relevant government agencies and civil societies. So people will know the suspicions, links, and um, all these irrelevant and very fraudulent activities. When they see them, they spot them and ensure they avoid them. Then there's need for collaboration between the public and private institutions. Then collaboration between um, internet service providers and the prosecution team. Um, and some other recommendations as well. One, one of them is also to ensure there is effective collaboration by nations of the world to ensure there is effective prosecution of cyber crimes in Nigeria and generally as a whole. Uh, as a conclusion, as the rate of internet usage increases in Nigeria, cyber crime is most likely to proliferate. Already in the international glare, Nigeria has been ranked as one of the top countries with the highest rate of cyber crime. It has now become imperative that the issue of cyber crime in Nigeria be seriously addressed. This is an ideal time to nip this menace in the bud. Effective and efficient collaboration between nations, local and international law enforcement agencies, as well as international community will definitely improve the prosecution of cyber crimes, not only in Nigeria, but globally. Thank you very much. At this point, I come to the end of my presentation. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Victor. Thank you very much. Because of time, I will not be able to ask a lot of questions. So I just have to add to what you presented 
why the next uh, presenter come on stage. So like what you said, um, computer-generated evidence to be submitted in court. You know, in digital forensic, as an invest investigator, you, while you are extracting your data for evidence, you know, you need to follow process and procedure to ensure that the evidence you generate admissible in court. You know, there's a tool called write blocker that once you are extracting your data from the laptop or from your desktop, with the write blocker, the information does not go. When you are working on the system, information can go back to the system and alter the initial data you have. So the write blocker will ensure that the information does not flow back to the system and thereby uh, making the evidence invalid. So it's also important to follow what is called a chain of custody. Chain of custody means that you document every information you, you gather, every process, every procedure, the timeline, they're all documented. And otherwise, your evidence will not be admissible in court. I totally agree with you. So because of time, we would like to call on the next. Uh, I also probably before we finish, maybe Sheila, she's a professional, and you are a legal professional, and uh, probably she has some questions to ask. So just hang on while I introduce the next uh, speaker. His name is uh, Inusa Suleiman. He's an investigative journalist, the CEO, Slide B Media Innovation. Slide. Yeah, hi. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, uh, let me share my slide first. I think the moderator has uh, introduced uh, us already, and uh, Mr. Victor, you speak explicitly well. Before you're talking all the time of <laughs> that we are supposed to do. So we we'll just uh, also throw more light on the, what we have here, and then uh, we we'll take it off from there. So <clears throat> before we start, we talk about we have to uh, talk about uh, investigating uh, cyber security. The aspect we are coming in is analyzing the aspects after the crime has been committed. What we do is we come in at uh, uh, as an uh, anal analysis to to ensure that the, the when the crime is committed you take it to the appropriate uh, uh, authority. For instance, what we do majorly is we will be the ones to, you know, go admit that when the crime is committed, the person comes to us and tells us that this is it. This is how the crime was committed and this is the problem. So we we'll gather all the information, we we'll analyze it. Then we we'll take it to the, uh, uh, to the appropriate authority to work on it. Then we we'll follow up on the, the the person that was uh, defrauded gets a proper uh, 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 justice for his uh, for his uh, for the offense that was committed. So in the introductions, malicious actors are always on the lookout for cyber vulnerability. You are a professional, no matter who you are, you are you are you you you, you must be exposed to cyber. Uh, 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 vulnerability because there are so many persons out there just waiting for your error. Any uh, little mistakes you make, they'll just take an advantage of you and they get it off of you. So the responsibility of uh, system is administrator and security officers is to ensure that the data on the server are safe and secure. Let me go to my next slide. Yeah, tips. So, there are some tips you need to know as regards to uh, uh, cyber security. First and foremost, you need to know what is cyber security. Secondly, you need to know the role of cyber security in investigating journalism. Then you want to take the, the, the tips to take for your digital safety. Then the bottom line, they will also have a case study. I don't know if time will permit us for, for all this anyway. So let, let, let me quickly start. So what is cyber security? As the word implies, cyber security. Majorly, what we, what we, what we are talking about cyber security just to minimize risks because there's no way 
you, you, can, you can do without not being involved. It's either you are outside or you are inside. So there's no way you can be, you, you, you be on the, the, uh, on, on the defense, but there must, you must be involved. So the best way is just to minimize the risks. The, the server security is set up for make sure that protects a server from all types of threats, such as DDoX attack, brutal force attack, and careless or malicious users. The measures can include installing and maintaining firewares, which we'll be talking about, we'll be talking about since in the, in the class, enforcing password and user authentication protocol, installing antivirus softwares and conducting regular backup to avoid data loss. I'll go to my next slide. So why is cyber security important? Cyber security is cyber, cyber play a key role in business sensitive, sensitive data, processing and, processing and storage. Protect servers from external threats with cyber security measure is essential for maintaining. Two, integrity. Integrity, cyber security ensure that the accuracy and completeness of data stored on the server by preventing temporary, uh, temporary and accidental modifications. Availability. Security measure helps play. Security measure have to play administrators keep to the server and its services available for authorized use at all times. Confidentiality, protection of sensitive data, protection of sensitive data are stored. Sorry. So, protection of sensitive data are stored when it comes to a uh, server because if your if your if your uh, inform if, if, like for example you have a network that is you, you is not well protected. You are bound to uh, 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 to uh, so many uh, fire where everybody coming in to uh, tap from your data. Like for example, you are using a, a, a free Wi-Fi that nobody has a, uh, a more control about. So you are subject to everybody coming in to do anything. They can they, they have access to your internet that because of no uh, protection from you. Start with source protection, of course, and protection is primary concern for everyone, not only for advanced investigative report, but for every journalist and, and can also tell that for every source, there is an information security practice that can be adopted according to the risk scenarios where this has to be done. They do not go back to the basis. Information security is most cases a basic digital hygiene. Philip said, despite the need for tailored approach to digital security, some simple measures should be adopted by everyone. Be you a security journalist or non-security journalist, there are some simple security measures you, you can adopt. The other time when uh, Facebook are having a lot of issues, you know, everybody, before you know your Facebook is being hacked, you've been, uh, you've been logged out, even from your right of your phone, you've been locked out. So, so, so many things have, been, have come up in this sense. So you have to, uh, Facebook now come up with two-step authentication. Thus, you have to follow the two-step authentication. For example, if you have a, a, a password that is for you, you need to have another different password. Anyway. Those are the two-step authentication uh, code, which means that if I have access to your Facebook, I might only have access to that first authentication code. The other one might come with your fingerprint, or rather, I can come with a very strong password. In fact, to some extent, where you generate a password, they'll tell you no, that the password you generated is not okay, that you have to go back and regenerate a very strong one so that you can, uh, you, for, for, for proper security measure. So they do not assume you won't be targeted. Except you are not, a, except you are not on the on the cyberspace. Everybody must be. Everybody is a type to be targeted. Whether it's not like you are making money on the internet, you are not making any money. You are just there for a social media appearances. You must be targeted. So you need to get ready. 
if you are a journalist covering a non-sensitive non topic within a general purpose public, you may think I don't need to adopt any, any, anything that will help you to secure it, but it could make you feel weak, like on the first time of attack. For example, you as a journalist, you, uh, you've covered an, an event already, then you felt, yeah, you are the only person that covers that event and you have a uh, 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 right over the event that you cover. Now, when you go to uh, editing rooms, that's where you want to send uh, information to uh, people. Sometimes before you, you could, they, they, contact, they, they could contact you for such information. In the press uh, 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 room, for example, where we print, your information might be leaked and you're the only one that covered inform that information. For example, you're expecting to, pro to project by uh, 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 next week, Monday. That's where you want the journal to come outside. Everybody can uh, have a look of it. You'll find out that if you didn't protect, if you didn't protect those information very well by ensuring that even the editor that is inside the, the room ensure that does not have more access to your information. If you didn't protect it very well, they might have access to it, and you find out that your information is in everywhere. Uh, my I think moderator is giving me time already, and I've not said anything. I don't know. So let me quickly. Uh, uh, we have a case study in uh, Nigeria here. Yeah. Where we were talking about uh, uh, one of my friends sells uh, a lot of uh, things online, uh, majorly uh, POP. So he doesn't have a shop. The shop is shop majorly online. The uh, what happens? The case was he came in and uh, someone contacted him online to tell him that they need POP. So the he was the, they were they were discussing. So at the point of discussion, they the, the know the numbers of uh, uh, bags and everything they need. So normally what we do is pay on delivery because you, since it's an online uh, business, you have to see uh, physically what you want to buy before you pay. So getting there now, the uh, person, the, the, this my guy showed the, the driver that, please, when you get there, ensure that you collect the money before if offloading the load. So it's like, okay, no problem. So when he gets there, he meets an uh, elderly person there. So the driver was, in fact, in his own side was also faulty because the, info, the, the, the information was, yes, okay, the information was ensure that you collect money before you, uh, you, you deliver the goods. So he didn't do, he didn't follow the information. He get, when he get there, he, he has to give the goods to the man because he felt he's an old man. And the old man pay money, when he pay money, pay to the wrong person because the rightful owner of the uh, uh, of the of the products was actually not talking to the old man. It was another person that advertised online that wasn't having that product that he was talking to. So indirectly, the account of that my uh, friends has been hacked. Yeah, and he doesn't know. He doesn't really know because someone was working on his accounts to get customers and um, sell a product that he does not have. So after much talk and all. We waited for money for two, three days. We didn't see, we began to see payment. So he was like, ah, Baba, how could you, I have not seen my payment. The person that he was talking to was nowhere to be found. He has off his line. So we have to tell the driver to go back to site and confirm from, to know if the goods are still there. So when the driver get there, he find out that the goods are still there and the old man, we saw the old man there. Okay, I have, I have to tell my friend that in this case, we have to involve, uh, 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 sorry, I think we are running out of time. So uh, the, my, 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 my share screen is actually available for you guys to follow up because the moderator is telling me that we are running out of time now. I have a lot of things here. So it's all right. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Suleiman. Suleiman on the field, investigating cases and uh, bringing us uh, scenarios. So we didn't have much time. I want to, uh, Sheila, you are a, a practitioner and uh, Victor is a legal practitioner. I don't know if you have any question to make it fluid. Just in the next uh, two minutes, if you have a question to ask him uh, as a lawyer, you know, and, uh, so that you can. Do you have a question? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, my only question was um, when you said that it looks like there's a lot of laws, which I, I was actually very surprised because I didn't think there was a lot of laws in place when I was doing my research. But uh, knowing all the laws that are in place, and then you said the challenges are implementing it, 
do you know if there has been any steps in place to actually make the attempt to be able to implement it? Because if we have all these laws and um, try to um, arrest people and we cannot implement it, then it's almost um, doesn't take us any. Thank you, Philip, for your question of um, implementation. Like I said, is a challenge, but um, it's something that would require some level of collaboration and cooperation by all the relevant practitioners, public, the private sector, and everyone related, international community as well. It's something that will keep improving with time. I believe in good time to get things right. Right. Thank you. I think we ran out of time, so I'll, yes, I'll... Rather one minute. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Sheila. Thank you, Victor, and thank you, Suleiman. It's been a pleasure, and um, thank uh, the organizers for giving us the, uh, the platform. Can you just say your final words? I will we'll close down. Sheila? Okay, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Yeah, again, thank you for giving us the opportunity. Um, I, I hope that Africa as a large we will be able to um, be born in cybersecurity and be able to also um, grow and be able to attract investors and, and so forth and, and help us improve. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Basway, for giving us this uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, for giving us this uh, uh, opportunity to talk about as regards to what is happening in the society presently. Now thank you so much.